Chapter 8 Schaefer didn't waste any time poking around on the lower floors. He went straight up to the room where the corpses had been strung up like so many slabs of beef. The bodies were gone, of course, carted away by either the feds or the cops, and so were the guns. Some of the debris had been cleaned away as well, or shoved aside. The bloodstains were still there, some of them anyway. They weren't red anymore, of course. They were dried to rusty brown or powdery black, and no one had bothered to clear away all the spent cartridges. Schaefer suspected there were just too many of them. The holes in the walls and ceiling were still there too, and that was what Schaefer wanted a good look at, at least to start. Most of them were bullet holes, of course. Automatic weapons had stitched back and forth across the room in every direction during the fight. There were three holes, though, that weren't right. He'd noticed them immediately when he'd come up here before. He'd mentioned them to Macomb. They weren't right. For one thing, they were far too big for bullet holes. Each was as big as a man's head. Each was about eye level for Schaefer. He figured that would be just above head height for most people, including the gang members who had died here. Nobody was going to be throwing punches that high up. If someone had picked up a man, raised him over his head like a wrestler doing an airplane spin, and then rammed him against the wall... No. These holes punched right through the wall. Do that with a man's head, and when you pull him back out, he'll probably be a bloody mess, and probably dead. The bodies, mangled as they were, hadn't shown that particular sort of injury. Schaefer had managed to read the autopsy reports before Macomb made them vanish. Some kind of weapon? Something like a mace? No. The holes were wrong for that. For one thing. Schaefer stepped back out into the corridor and around into the next room where the hole came out and looked at it. Then he turned and looked at the far wall. There was another hole there. He'd thought when he looked through from the other side that he'd seen one. And yes, the two lined up, but the second, smaller hole was below the first. That meant that whatever had made them had been angled downward. Schaefer strode back to the bigger room, the room where the massacre had taken place. He looked through the opening, judged the angle, tried to guess where the killer had stood, and then estimated the height of whatever had made that hole. It looked to him as if some son of a bitch must have been wearing a cannon on his hat and had neatly collected the cannonballs when he was done. Or did Macomb have those cannonballs locked away somewhere? Schaefer wouldn't put it past him. He reached out and touched the edge of the hole. It was charred. That wasn't just powder burns or soot. Whatever it was that had punched the hole had charred the lathe for a good half inch around the opening. That had been something hot. A bullet wouldn't do that, nor would a cannonball. Incendiaries of some sort? But then why was the building still standing? This was something different. Something strange. Schaefer remembered that last conversation with Dutch. Remembered some things Dutch had said that he hadn't mentioned to Rash in the car. About how a good enough hunter wouldn't want to bother hunting anything as stupid as a mere animal. He remembered Dutch talking about weapons such as a hunter might use. Stuff that didn't exist yet anywhere on earth, so far as Schaefer knew. He'd thought Dutch was just rambling drunkenly. He didn't think so anymore. If the killers had a weapon that would punch holes through walls like this, maybe they had other things that Dutch had talked about too. Perfect camouflage that made them effectively invisible, something that protected them from bullets. Schaefer began to see why the army, or whoever General Phillips worked for, might be involved. He began to feel something else as well, Something he'd felt before, something he'd been feeling off and on for days, but never as strongly as this. It was a prickly feeling of something indefinably wrong, a feeling like something brushing the hairs at the back of his neck. He remembered Dutch asking if he'd ever wondered what it felt like to be hunted. Right now, Schaefer thought he knew exactly how it felt. He turned. The room was empty. He looked through the hole, and the room on the other side was empty as well. He stepped slowly away from the wall and turned a full 360 degrees, ending up facing the hole again. He didn't see anything, but the light was poor, and a good hunter used camouflage. The prey wasn't supposed to see him. 
and these hunters might have perfect camouflage. He started to turn again, and all of a sudden it was there, just at arm's length. Schaefer knew this was the killer, or at least one of the killers, and that he couldn't afford to play nice. He snatched at his automatic and pulled it up from its holster as he said, Figured you might show up. I could feel you. Can't say that I'm in pre- He was talking to distract it, but it wasn't working. He was in the middle of a word, his pistol halfway drawn, when a huge, yellowish fist slammed across his jaw and sent him reeling backward. The pistol flew to one side, and Schaefer's mouth filled with blood. The lower teeth on one side suddenly all felt loose. Blood spurted from his nose. He landed on his hands and knees, facing away from the thing that loomed over him, outlined against the gaping hole in the wall. <laughs> Lucky punch, he said. It wasn't human. It stood on two legs, and was shaped more or less like a man, but it was too big and too fast. As he knelt, half dazed for a fraction of a second, he saw its feet in their heavy silver sandals, saw the four toes with their curving black talons. He started to turn and saw the greyish yellowish legs, the gleaming metal greaves, the black netting that covered its body. This was the hunter that Dutch had talked about. It had to be. The thing that had killed Dutch's squad. It wasn't any gang of terrorists that had done these killings. It was this, this monster, this hunter, whatever it was. But it didn't matter what it was or what it looked like. He had to take it down. This killer had invaded his city, his turf. This thing had attacked him. It was big and strong and fast. It had him down, but he had to beat it. He couldn't afford the time to look at it, not when it was as fast as it was. Schaefer threw his weight forward onto his hands and drove a boot upward into the thing's belly. And if he fell short and caught it in the crotch, he wouldn't mind that either. He didn't catch it anywhere. A clawed hand caught him instead. Black talons locked around his ankle before his foot had covered half the distance he had intended, and the glow of the streetlights outside sparked off jagged-edged blades that projected from the complicated band of gadgetry on the thing's wrist. Before Schaefer could even begin to twist a struggle to try to escape, the thing picked him up by that one leg and flung him away. It moved impossibly fast, but with casual ease and grace, as if this was nothing for it, as if it wasn't even trying. Then Schaefer slammed into the wall and stopped noticing details. He heard plaster and lathe crunch on impact, and for a millisecond or so, he hoped that he hadn't heard any of his bones breaking. Then his head snapped back and hit an exposed stud, and he wasn't able to hope anything. He tried not to pass out, tried to force himself back to full alertness. He was on the floor, looking up through a haze, and he saw those yellowish claws reaching for him that blank thing that wasn't a face looking down at him. It wasn't a face. It was metal. The thing was wearing some kind of mask. Then its fingers, or claws, whichever they had, were closed on Schaefer's bruised jaw and wrenched his head sideways, exposing his neck, turning his eyes away so that he couldn't see anymore, and Schaefer tried to force defiance out through the blood in his throat. Asshole, he said as he tried to bring himself to fight, to force his hands to strike at the thing. Then something bit into his flesh below his left ear, and Schaefer screamed, not so much at the pain, it hurt like hell, like three hot knives had just punched into his neck, but he could handle pain. He screamed at the violation. The thing wasn't killing him, it was doing something else. What the hell? He gasped as the thing stood up and stepped back. Did you do? Schaefer's hand closed on a broken 2 by 4 and his anger gave him strength. To me! He shouted as he came up swinging. The blow of the 2 by 4 caught the thing on the side of its head and the mask wrenched to one side. It reached up to straighten it, but Schaefer was there first, following up his attack. The crooked mask or helmet or whatever it was was blocking the thing's vision. It was blinded. If he could keep it blinded, he might have a chance. He grabbed for the metal mask and got both thumbs under the edge. The thing reached up and ripped him away, but his grip held and the mask tore free as well. Something sparked and Schaefer heard a hiss like escaping gas, but he didn't have time to worry about that. 
he was falling backward towards the hole in the wall where the window had once been. The mask was in his hands and he was staring at a face straight out of a nightmare. A huge, mottled face framed in black snake-like locks. A face with great baleful eyes and a fang-rimmed mouth that worked in layers like that of some unspeakable deep-sea horror. The fangs flexed as if reaching for him. Schaefer landed on his feet this time, caught his balance by slamming the mask against the floor with a ringing clang and stared at his foe. Those mouth parts moved again, the outermost ring of fangs opening like some ghastly flower, an inner membrane vibrating. And the thing spoke. Trick or treat, it said in a voice that Schaefer knew, in Carr's voice, amplified to deafening volume. Then it came at him again, and even Schaefer knew better than to charge the thing or to stand his ground. He took a step backward, trying to dodge, and his foot landed on something hard, something that shouldn't have been there, something that went out from under him. And as he tumbled backwards out the hole in the building's wall, he realised that he tripped over his own dropped pistol. And then he was out of the window and falling, falling head first towards the street, five stories below.